So even though the universe is expanding, it expands in such a way that the universe remains mostly homogeneous and isotropic. Now you say, what, what does that mean? The universe, it's a technical term. The universe remains homogeneous and isotropic. Homogeneous and isotropic means this. Homogeneous means all, location, uh, all locations of the universe are more or less the same. There aren't too many differences depending on what galaxy you live in. No particular galaxy is so different that that galaxy can be called the center of the universe or the edge of the universe. No galaxy cluster is so different that it's a unique cluster. It can be called the center or the edge, you see? No matter where you live, more or less the universe looks the same. Okay, that would be true of any good cake that you bake, right? If you're a good cake baker, who is a good cake baker here? Make good cakes? I love cakes. I like the, you know, Thanksgiving or whatever, getting together, eating pie or uh, raisin pudding. Uh, if you are making a good cake, do you want a particular portion of the cake to taste better than the others? Then whoever gets that portion is going to be the most thankful for you, you know. You want that portion to have the most raisins? No, you want the raisins to be kind of uniformly distributed, right? You want the bread to be about as well done on all locations. So pretty much if you're a good baker, you want the cake to be homogeneous. You don't want the particular piece of the cake to be different. That's what the universe is, you see. Isotropic means a little different. The universe looks the same in all directions, okay? Homogeneous means the universe looks the same in all locations. Isotropic, the universe looks the same in all directions. That means if we look to our north and study the northern sky, we shouldn't find that the northern sky looks that much different than the western sky. Of course, there are going to be some stars that are in different locations, but it shouldn't be that much different. There should still be clusters of galaxies in the west. There should be clusters of galaxies in the north, east, south. So there should be no direction that, say, uh, that everybody can agree. In other words, if we go to Venus and if we go to Mars and we live there, and we shouldn't all agree that the northern sky is so unique, let's all call that north. Okay, if you go to Venus and Mars, your northern sky is going to look different than my northern sky because my northern sky is no particular special. You see? My northern sky is just basically wherever the axis of the Earth is tilting, pointing towards Polaris. I happen to call that the North Star. But if you live in Venus, you're going to have a different North Star. So no one is going to agree on what north is, what west is, what east is. So all directions are equivalent. You see? So that's what isotropic means. So it pretty much makes sense. A good cake will also be isotropic. You don't want this direction to be different than this direction, you see. Okay, so this led astronomers to postulate that the universe must have once been tiny small, as I said before, when you run the movie backwards, and then you say, you postulate that the universe began very small. And then tiny, small, and exploded. This came to be known as the Big Bang Theory, kind of as a mocking wave, and then the term stuck to the concept. Hubble also proved that the farther galaxies are receding away from us at a faster rate. That's this law. V equals HD. The farther away they are, the faster that they move. Okay? Uh, this is known as the Hubble law. Okay? V equals HD. So he did studies like this, for example. If you look at the slide here. See here, he did, um, let's say he takes a certain galaxy called Virgo, okay? And uh, the distance of Virgo from us is 24 megaparsecs, okay? So 24 million parsecs. And then he looks at the hydrogen and potassium um, spectral lines. So you can see here the colors of the, the spectrum here. This is violet. This is uh, blue, and then the, over here would be the red and orange. So they didn't put all of them here. 
So Roy G. Biv. So you have red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Okay. So what they're showing you here is that you have the hydrogen line right here. Now look here. For this uh, galaxy, Ursa Major, it's 300 mega parsecs away, 300 million parsecs away. So it's farther away. And the shift, you see here, towards the red. So if this would have been the regular hydrogen line, you find it over here. So the shift is more drastic. From there, you calculate its velocity, 15,000 meters, kilometers per second. So the Virgo galaxy is moving away from us at 1,200 kilometers per second because the shift is uh, pretty small from here to here. So this one, this one that they're showing you is the hydrogen line for a stationary galaxy. So the shift amount is this way. You see, so it's moving away from us, but not too, the shift is not too much. This one, the shift is from here to here. So it's moving away from us at 15,000 kilometers per second. Now we go to uh, this one. This one is 780 megaparsecs away. So the shift is from here all the way to here. So it's moving away from us 39,000 kilometers per second. The more the shift, the faster the object is moving. So it becomes kind of like those raisins. You see, the fa farther away the galaxy is, the faster they move. And then if you go down to this galaxy, Hydra, 1,220 kilo, uh, megaparsecs away. And the shift is all the way to here, 61,000 kilometers per second. So all that's left to do now is take all of these data, make a plot of them. Okay? And then you're going to get something looking like this. So you get the distance of the galaxy from us in million parsecs. And then you get the velocity in kilometers per second. So now you, s you see here that the farther away the galaxy is, the faster it's moving away from us. And then you start getting data points. Now some of the galaxies don't fit the data perfectly. So they're below that line. Some of them are above. Okay. So you get to 60. It's going to be double 80. Now, this graph represents some of the original data that Hubble had and uh, the, the other people had in the original like 1930s, 1940s, 50s. They didn't have too many data for these galaxies because their equipment wasn't that advanced. Since then, we have a lot more data. Okay? So what would happen is they would draw a straight line through that, and then they would try to come up with the slope of that line. V equals HD. V is like Y. V is the vertical axis. D is the horizontal axis. And of course, M is the slope, right? Y equals MX. So H is the slope of this line. <coughs> so some of the original data were coming. H is 67. Other people were saying H is 85. Other people were saying H is 100, and so on and so forth. They were disagreeing on the data. Okay? What are the units of H, by the way? What is the units of H? It's going to be whatever units of velocity divided by time. You see? Velocity, divide, uh, no, velocity divided by distance. So it's going to be uh, the units in kilometers per second. Per what? Megaparsec. Megaparsec. But if you really think about it, megaparsec and kilometers, they're both units of distance. I can convert from megaparsec to kilometer, and I can get rid of that, OK, there, I, I, by using a certain conversion. So in reality, the units of the Hubble constant if I get rid of kilometer and megaparsec, what's left? 
1 over seconds, right? Once I get rid of the kilometers and the megaparsec. That's key. Because if I invert the Hubble constant, what do I get? Units of what? Seconds. That means the 1 over the Hubble constant can act as a way to find out the age of the universe. Because that's units of time. You see? So if I know at the rate at which these velocities are moving away from us, that's the Hubble constant tells you that. If I invert that Hubble constant, it will tell me when this process began, you see? So some of the original data that was coming from the Hubble constant, they were saying it's 90, 100. When they were inverting that, the age of the universe was coming 5 billion years old, 6 billion years old. The problem with that is we were discovering galaxies that were 8 billion years old, 9 billion years old. So we went back to the data and we said the Hubble constant can't be that high. Correct it. So they did more measurements, more measurements, more, more refinements. They found out the Hubble constant is a little smaller. Smaller is better. Because if the Hubble constant is smaller, we invert it, we get a bigger age of the universe, right? So the finally, finally, <coughs> Roughly around the last uh, 20 years or so, we are agreeing that the Hubble constant is about 71. 70, 71. Sometimes you see people saying data 69. OK, that's the data. So 71 kilometers per second per megaparsec. You see? 71 kilometer per second per megaparsec. But as I said, these two can be eliminated. And then you can get units of just 1 over seconds. OK, so what does this mean? Based on this data, a galaxy that is 1 million parsecs away from us will be moving away at a rate of 71 kilometers per second. That's what they're finding. For every million parsec, a galaxy is moving away 71 kilometers per second. What if you find that a galaxy is moving away from you at a velocity of 500 kilometers per second? So here's the other good thing about this law. Not only does it help us find the age of the universe, it also becomes a way of finding distances to galaxies. Once you can agree on a good Hubble constant, OK, let's turn off this thing. So once you can agree on the correct value of the Hubble constant, now you'll go searching for different galaxies, right? And then you find one that you're interested in studying, and you find that it's moving away from you at 500 kilometers per second. How do we know? How would we know that it's moving away at 500 kilometers per second? What would we study? The redshift, right? The amount of the redshift. We would study the amount of the redshift. If we can determine the amount of the redshift of the spectral lines of that star, we know how the velocity that it's moving at. We apply a certain equation, we can determine that. Now, once we agree on the value of the Hubble constant, let's say we, we agree it's 71, 71 kilometer per second per megaparsec. See, it becomes a way of finding the distance to the galaxy. This is one of the most accurate ways of finding distances. So kilometer per second, kilometer per second cancels. Then what do we get? 500 over 71. And then what happens? Megaparsec goes over there. So that means that galaxy is 500 over 71 megaparsecs away. And whatever that comes out to, I think I have the answer there. If you divide this, you're going to get 22.95 million light years. Well, what I did is I converted it to light years. Because when you divide this, you get um, 500 over 71. You're probably going to get 7 or something. Yeah. You're going to get 7.04 million parsecs. But I'm more, I'm more interested in the distance to the galaxy in light years because I like the light year unit. So then I say one parsec is 3.26 light years. 
parsec parsec cancel. So 7.04 times 3.26. That's going to give you a million light years. And then when you multiply 7 times 3, 22.95 million light years away. You see? And then we can keep doing this as detectives. Go find another galaxy, find its dis uh, velocity, how fast it's moving away. We can find its distance, and then we can keep populating the data all we want. You see? So the, once we agree on this, then the Hubble law is very useful in finding distances to galaxies. You see, the Hubble time, 1 over h. Remember what I was saying? The Hubble constant is, has units of essentially just 1 over seconds. If you invert that, you're going to get units of seconds. So for a Hubble constant of 71, our Hubble time comes out to be 13.73 billion years. When you convert it, you get seconds. And then when you convert from seconds to years, you get that many. This makes sense to us because most of the objects we've discovered are less than 13 billion years old. They're, they're about 12, 12 and a half billion years, 13 billion years. So we haven't discovered anything older than that. So it fits the data. It fits the data that we have. So this is how long ago the Big Bang happened, 13.7 billion years. So the age of the universe is related to the Hubble time. That's why there has been lots of debate as to the exact value of the Hubble constant until we finally settled on 71. You see? So the age of the universe, the Hubble time, okay, is the maximum age of the universe. It sets an upper limit. The universe cannot be older than 13.73 year, billion years old. It can be slightly younger, but it can't be older at all. It sets an upper limit, okay? Uh, if we go back, uh, go to the, one of the handouts that I have, I'll, I'll show you some of the key properties of the universe here, and then they have some different constants. We'll talk about this throughout the lecture today. We have the Hubble constant, density parameter, matter density, density parameter, dark energy, age of the universe. Age of the universe at the time of recombination, redshift z at the time of recombination. So we have Hubble constant, H0, present day expansion rate of the universe, 73.2 plus minus 3.1, 3.2, kilometers per second per megaparsec. So on that data table, they're saying it's 73, but there's an error of 3.1 or minus 3.2, you see? So it's, it could be off by as much as 3. OK, when you look at data tables online, you can find even ones that are more uh, accurate than this one, that are more updated than this one. This isn't necessarily the most recent one, OK? Um, then when you look down here, age of the universe, this is going to depend on that. This is the reciprocal of that, you see? So T0 is 1 over H. So elapsed time from the Big Bang to the present day, 13.73 billion years, okay? If you go over here, you see, 1.373 times 10 to the 10th years. What does that mean? Well, if you move over the decimal, and then you reduce this by not, make it 9, right? You go like that, make it 9. This, and 10 to the 9th is going to be billion. So that means the universe started 13.73 billion years ago. And then with an uncertainty of plus 0.016 minus 0.015. That's pretty, that's pretty accurate there. That's amazing that we know the age of the universe to within that much accuracy now, OK?